As Luke records in this gospel message, recounts the first event in Jesus' public ministry. Jesus has recently been baptized, and immediately after that event, he was driven out into the wilderness. I must admit, out into the wilderness seems such a mortal phrase for what he experienced. Over a period of 40 days, he is constantly tempted by the devil, unsuccessfully. After that harrowing experience, he does what many humans do when severely tested. He went home. Home to Nazareth. The place he grew up. A place he would have found comforting in the midst of people who he would have recognized the streets and little landmarks he could remember and associate with. It's the Sabbath, and Jesus makes his way to the synagogue as he has done many times before. Word would have no doubt spread that he'd been teaching in the surrounding Galilean synagogues. Now you may be wondering why we haven't heard about the call of the first disciples, as you come to expect in our Gospels. Well, Luke changes the order of the Gospel of Mark. <coughs> In Luke, we don't hear the call of the first disciples of the very beginning, it comes later. Instead, Luke takes a story that was found in the middle of Mark and makes it the first event of Jesus' public ministry. And in doing so, he sets the whole tone for his gospel within this first story. He clearly had, I guess you could say, a coming plan. This was Jesus' first sermon in his hometown synagogue. All those in the synagogue would have known him and his family, and here he was, ready to preach to them. I guess they'd be wondering what he was going to say. Now they knew it would be something from Isaiah, as that was the portion of the Torah that had been allotted to his family to read on that allotted day. But what passage? Jesus say in his first sermon. He was the guest preacher. After all, it had to be important. And having been handed the text of Isaiah, he was then free to choose the passage. And choose he did. Isaiah 61. He reads, rolls up the scroll, gives it back to the tent, and he then sits. And the eyes of all were fixed on him. And we were probably looking forward to the sermon as everybody knew the text and what it meant, or so they thought. And the sermon begins. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now we know that those words came as a bit of a shock to those listening. But today, we're not concerned with the rest of the chapter. We're not concerned with the response of those who have just heard this remarkable statement. We are concerned with ultimately two fundamental understandings. Jesus announces fulfillment of prophecy and then succinctly defines what his messianic role is. And everything that Luke defines and everything that Luke point to these understandings. And if you want a clear and concise understanding of who Jesus was and is, Luke makes it clear that you can't do much better than read Isaiah. Luke makes it absolutely clear that the poor, the captives, the blind, and the oppressed define the core of who Jesus is. Bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. If Jesus' mission was to bring relief to the poor, release, recovery, and setting the oppressed free, then what's the mission of our church? If the mission of the church is to bring relief to the poor, then what's our mission as practicing Christians? Now, in preparing this sermon, I plan to spend a little time exploring the notion of spirit. After all, our reading today begins with the words, that Jesus filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And the first words spoken by Jesus begin, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
And I've been struck by how these two phrases powerfully focused on the power of the Spirit of Jesus, of how the Spirit drove at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But then something got in the way. Yesterday, the mission held a family day next door. We wanted to show the families of our staff and supporters the building. And I had the great pleasure of being one of the many guides. And as we walked the building, slowly making our way upwards to the rooftop, I couldn't help but notice that as we walked and as I described the various services that would soon inhabit the building, I saw how the description of these spaces and the services bore an uncanny match to the words of Isaiah 61. Good news to the poor. Now certainly good news to the poor would appear to be obvious and safe, that very few hopefully would dispute that we do have poverty and that it's unacceptable. Some time ago a client confided with me, I don't mind so much not having much money, but I get by and I'm not used to it. But what really affects me is that I'm lonely. Two kinds of poverty, which together is enough to crush any soul. Release to the captive. Again, some time ago, whilst working in detox, another client talked about he was so utterly tired of being addicted. He'd struggled for most of his life to this addiction. And he died not long after that conversation. Recovery of sight to the blind. Now, a few years ago, the mission embarked on a remarkable piece of research called Family 100. A hundred families and individuals were interviewed in depth over a period of months about their economic situation, their interactions with government departments, and the difficulties they faced their families, accessing medical services, many other aspects of their lives. All would be accounted as poor. The results of that research were horrifying. When those results were presented to various organs of the state and commercial and business leaders, a common response was made. Oh, we had no idea that things were so bad here in New Zealand. Free the oppressed. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was quoted as saying, There's no, nothing ever to equal being free. You can't put a money value to being free, to be able to wake up in the country and not have to say, Do I have my pass on me? Am I allowed to go there? Can I take my children to that school? And he tells of walking past a playground with his daughter and having to stop her from playing in the swings. She would protest, but there are other children there. And he says, you got, and you got quite sick having to say it. Yes, there are other children there, but they're not quite children like you. If I was a priest, then I would imagine that being welcomed into a remarkable building such as home ground would give me pause to think that I do have value in this world. That I can begin to live a life free from worry and want and, and free to make positive decisions about how I can live my life. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus' mission is consistently focused on the words of Isaiah. His actions and words demonstrate that. And if there was ever an antidote to the claim that Jesus was born die on the cross, then today's text must surely challenge that notion. Luke by Isaiah tells us that Jesus was born to save, to free, and to liberate people. Now as we head into Lent, perhaps that realisation could encourage us to explore other ways of thinking of Jesus' ministry beyond simply going to the cross. It could encourage us to explore other ways of thinking of our parish's ministry by extension, our own. It might encourage us to imagine how we could interact with home ground and the mission. We share a history.
history and our respective missions are not too dissimilar. We have two wonderful buildings side by side. Now I'm not suggesting that the building will somehow magically solve the poverty, oppression, or blindness, but it will become an important agent, a wonderful space where skilled practitioners and willing lay people could together push back against those things that oppress, capture, or blind humans. Okay, you might say, what's the plan? Well, to be honest, I don't really have the answers. You would think that for someone who had been part of this place for 25 or over 25 years and part of the mission for a similar period of time, that I might. I do have some ideas, and I have thought about it, but I don't have a clear picture of what form our mission could take if we were to somehow work out the words of today's gospel reading in conjunction with our neighbours. We've been neighbours for some time now, and many of our parishioners have and are currently involved with mission work, and their contribution is greatly valued. However, we have often talked about how we as a collective might interact with the mission and our home ground. Uh, perhaps that's a good thing. Perhaps the spirit might help so that we might, to quote St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times and, when necessary, use words.